This morning's reading is taken from Exodus chapter 15, uh, verses 22 to 27, which you'll find on page 73 of your church Bibles. The waters of Marah and Elam. Then Moses led Israel from the Red Sea, and they went into the desert of Shur. For three days they travelled in the desert without finding water. When they came to Marah, they could not drink its water because it was bitter. That is why the place is called Marah. So the people grumbled against Moses, saying, What are we to drink? Then Moses cried out to the Lord, and the Lord showed him a piece of wood. He threw it into the water, and the water became sweet. There the Lord made a decree and a law for them, and there he tested them. He said, If you listen carefully to the voice of the Lord your God, and do what is right in his eyes, if you pay attention to his commands and keep all his decrees, I will not bring on you any of the diseases I brought on the Egyptians, for I am the Lord who heals you. Then they came to Elam, where there were twelve springs and seventy palm trees, and they camped there near the water. This is the word of the Lord. Hi folks, if there's anyone who doesn't know me, I'm Cheska, one of the occasional preachers. And I'd say that we're continuing our series in Moses, but we're not quite because we've been doing around Exodus 20, which is the giving of the commandments, and now for some reason we're rewinding to Exodus 15. So you'll have to forget everything we've done in the last few weeks and go back to the children of Israel have just gone through the Red Sea, they've had a little praise party and then they've started travelling in the desert. I've really, really, really struggled with this passage, finding something unique to say. I've read it, I've read round it, I've prayed about it and I just wasn't getting anything. And then suddenly God had a really powerful message for me. So I'm going to share that and hope that it will um, work for you as well. So let's start with something completely different. I got a wedding invitation to a wedding in um, Caravastasis, which is the port of Foligandros. Anyone heard of Foligandros? Yeah. Um, which is about 50 minutes from um, Santorini by ferry. Now, the problem with this wedding is that the invite was for me, my daughter, and my da daughter's partner. But they wanted to go and have a little holiday on Santorini first, which meant that I had to travel by myself. I'm not a good alone traveller, and I hadn't been on a plane since, since COVID, so I was quite anxious about it. So I did two things. I did really meticulous planning. Uh, everything down to the last detail, and a lot of prayer. And I told house group, I said, please pray for me, I'm very anxious about this, and I will be happy once I sit on seat 13C on the EasyJet plane. So they prayed, and I wasn't anxious, actually, and so everything worked out fine. I knew the journey to Gatwick was going to be horrible, but the timings were great. And so I got, sat down on seat 13C, took a picture of it, sent it to house group to say, made it. Got my book out and the stewardess came along and said, can I have a look at your boarding pass? You know you're sitting in 13D, don't you? So I've been so worried about doing something really stupid, but luckily that was the only stupid thing I did. And so, we all went to the most beautiful wedding on the beach. What has this got to do with the passage? Well, we'll find out. The only vague link is that Foligandros doesn't have drinking water, so you had to be really careful to buy your bottled water, or you could get very thirsty because it was hot. So let's go back to our passage. So I felt that the, the theme that God was telling me was about trusting God and particularly coping with bitter disappointments. But 
just coping with life and how to trust God. Now, the children of Israel have a real reputation for whinging, but I think in this instant, they kind of deserved it. So, human beings apparently, in good circumstances, can live for about 100 hours without water. But these people were not in good circumstances. They were walking through the desert in the blazing sun. They had all their cattle, they had all their belongings. And the first day without water, bad. Second, bad. By the third day, the older people and the children were beginning to be strongly dehydrated. So it's not that surprising the people were struggling. Now, trusting God seems to have several components. I think the first thing we need to do when we're trusting God is understand that he is all-powerful. Now, the children of Israel didn't have any problem about God's power because they'd seen it. They'd seen it in the plagues and they'd seen it in the parting of the Red Sea. But the next quick thing is trusting that this powerful God actually cares enough for you to do something. And I think this is where the children of Israel had real difficulties. Because yes, they had their stories, what we call the book of Genesis, that they'd passed down. But this God hadn't spoken to them for 400 years. So their experience of a God would be Pharaoh, because the Egyptians believed that Pharaoh was divine, that he was the son of Ra, the sun God. So what was their experience of God? Yes, powerful. Yes, cruel. Yes, abusive. Yes, capricious. So how would they know that this God, the God of Israel, Yahweh, was different? And we also know that abused people have big trust problems. So every time you you get cross about the children of Israel whinging, just think about that. But for Moses, I think there were different issues. He had no problem with the power of God after what he'd seen. I don't really think he had problems trusting the care of God. Because remember, Moses journey to this point was very different to the children of Israel. He'd been loved by his mum, acting as his wet nurse. He'd been loved by his adoptive mum, the princess of Egypt. He'd had a life of privilege. Even when things went horribly wrong and he killed an Egyptian and he had to flee, he ended up in the family of Jethro, who became his son-in-law. And Jethro was a very wise man who probably acted as a great role model for Moses. So he had those parts, right? But I think the problem that Moses had was trusting that God would work through him. It was a confidence in God working in himself. It wasn't about arrogance or self-confidence. It was the fact that he could do amazing things if God was with him. Because remember when God said, go to Pharaoh, And Moses said, I can't do that. I'm not articulate enough. So Aaron came as well. So I think Moses led the people through the desert. First day, they cope without water. Second day, they cope without water. By the third day, they were beginning to panic. And then there was water, but it was bitter. And with Moses, with his lack of self-confidence, he was thinking, have I heard God right? Have I led these people out to die? But he doesn't win. She cries out to God. And God makes the water sweet. And God gives them a kind of little sermon. Remember, this is before the Ten Commandments and so on. He says, if you listen carefully to your God, do what's right in his eyes, if you pay attention to his commands and keep all his decrees, I will not bring you any of the diseases I brought on the Egyptians, for I am the God who heals you. So kind of what he's saying is I'm not an abusive, capricious God. And the authority I have on you is not the sort that the Egyptians had, which was caused by whips. But if you come and if you make yourself into my people, the people of God, I will be a kind and loving and healing God, which is what they needed to hear. So what he was doing was he was giving them two things, a relationship with him and a responsibility to be his people. And so they could walk on. And as they went through this 
really 40 year journey to learn to trust God enough that they could enter the promised land. So what's that story got to do with us living in, in Surrey in the 2023? It's a very different world, but we still have the same need to trust God, don't we? And things have not been easy. We've had our desert experience. We've had COVID. But we've come out of COVID and things have not seemed to get much better. We have war. We have the, the earth burning at the moment. We have the cross of living crisis. And we have the stuff that's gone wrong in our own church. And that the fact that the church is in decline in this country because all the people left during COVID and never came back. And then there's just stuff going on in our own lives, our individual things that cause problems. We need to learn to trust. And I think we do have a problem with understanding how powerful God is because we haven't seen the plagues. We haven't seen the parting of the Red Sea. We just read about them. We're not generally seeing God doing miracles among us, which makes it more difficult. Sometimes we don't trust God to be caring enough. It's like, God, if you really cared, why are all these terrible things happening to me? And then we have the third thing, trusting that God's actually going to work through us. I think there's a sort of chronic lack of self-esteem in people, isn't there? We say, but surely God can't use me. So we don't do anything and we don't build our trust. But Jesus has given us words very similar to the words that God gave about if we obey his commands. It's in John 14. It says, if you obey, if you keep my commands, and we'll send you the Holy Spirit. And if you keep my commands, then I will come and live with you and God will come and live with you. So it's the same thing. Jesus is promising us a relationship and it's a much closer relationship than the Israelites had because they had to work through a mediator, Moses, but we can go straight into the presence of God. And it's a responsibility, just like the people in those days needed to trust God to learn to be the people he wanted them to be. So we have a responsibility to be the people God wants us to be, to be bringing his kingdom. So what's that got to do with anything? Well, God spoke to me very strongly about what I should be doing. Now, for me, um, life's changed dramatically. It kind of used to be easy to serve God because I was doing this incredibly demanding job. And it was obviously serving God. Although I was, took all my time and energy. And then in February, I retired. And suddenly, I've got all this time to do what I want, to visit friends, to go to weddings in Greece, and so on. And it's really understanding again how to serve God in those circumstances and how to trust God. And what God's been saying to me is trusting God, developing trust in God, is to making a use of every experience so that even the little things that cause niggles, you can use to learn to trust God more. So that when the big disappointments come, you've got a sort of bank of trust to help you. So the question that comes first is, am I putting Jesus first? Because what's the point of trusting if you're not trusting in anything? Second one is, Am I trusting God? And the third one is, am I trusting God to work through me? And when I look back on my Folly Gandros wedding experience, I have to think, am I putting God, Jesus first? I think I went to Folly Gandros to have a nice beach holiday. I mean, it's a fantastic place, and that's why I went. But out of the 46 people who come from all over the world to this wedding, I think I was the only Christian and it wasn't in my head that I was going to serve Jesus. And I wasn't going to sort of 
pray for um, the rampant atheist uh, groom and the Eastern mystic bride. I was just going to enjoy. And that struck me afterwards that in every experience I need to start looking. I think because it was so easy when I was working and obviously I was working so hard I was having to put God first. But now in my leisure it's working out Jesus comes first, I am still representing Jesus. And then the trust in God comes easier because it's kind of, you know, asking God to help you get on a plane is a bit like asking God to help you find a parking space, you know, when you know that the world's burning and people are starving. But asking God to help you get on a plane so that you can do his will is a very different thing. And, and it's, it's, it's not trusting God to just, just give us great things. It's trusting God to help us serve him. And then the third thing is the, the Moses thing. Am I trusting God to work through me? Have I got the sort of chronic low self-esteem that makes me think, well, I'll go to Greece, but I don't have anything to offer. And funnily enough, I had two opportunities given to me to sort of mention faith so that some people did actually know I was a Christian. Didn't do any great gospel stuff, but you know, people would know I was a Christian. So I think the message I have mostly for me, but hopefully for you as well, is with every experience that comes up. So this week I have my partially blocked toilet to sort out and all the pitfalls that I'm actually quite worried about going to new wine next week. There's a lot of things that can go wrong there. So I think for, for those things and for everything else we have, it's actually intentionally, not just drifting into things, which is very easy when you're retired, but intentionally, am I putting Jesus first in this? Am I trusting God? And do I believe that God can actually make a difference through me?